we go. <clears throat> Thanks very much to everyone for logging in for today's webinar titled the DTX Extreme Echo Sounder for Fisheries Applications. This is a portable scientific echo sounder system with some unique autonomous capabilities. So as are each of Biosonic's echo sounders that they manufacture, uh, this is a scientific grade instrument, calibrated scientific echo sounder, uh, really designed for the assessment of fisheries resources. So when we talk about fisheries resources, we can measure those resources in different ways. We can look at total biomass or fish density. <clears throat> we can look at fish schools, look at the number of fish in a school, the size of that school, or we can of course do a population estimate and also do age classing or sizing distributions. Some of the advantages of the DTX Extreme, well, it, it is a split beam sonar, so capable of operating split beam transducers, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, of course, widely accepted use throughout the world. There's hundreds of DTX units uh, in use by universities and government agencies all around the globe. Uh, unique is the fact that this is a multi-channel, multi-frequency system. So as you see in the, di in the image here, we can connect more than one transducer using a splitter cable. And in fact, we can, we can use up to four uh, transducers with a four-way splitter. And those transducers can be different frequency and all split beam. Very rugged, field-worthy system. We'll talk about the degree of that ruggedness uh, a little bit later. And Biosonics transducers, this is a unique uh, feature. They, they are digital transducers. So we digitize inside the transducer uh, we have those circuit boards to convert the analog signal into a digital one. So we are less prone to any interference uh, in the signal cable. Split beam, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, split beam is a type of sonar, and it really is the core tool that's used by um, agencies and, and researchers for measuring fishery stocks. And several reasons why split beam sonar is the instrument of choice. Uh, it's long range, so truly we can detect up to a, an over a kilometer in range. So quite a long range sensor. It's very good for deep ocean research. <clears throat> Again, it's well proven. There's decades of uh, papers and publications in support of this, the technology and the methods. But probably most importantly is the reason why a split beam is used is it allows for the accurate measurement of what is called target strength. Target strength is basically the reflectivity of an object, and that is directly related to the physical size of the target. So split beam allows us to measure the size of fish. And that's really the, the, the most, probably the most important um, attribute of, of split beam sonar. <clears throat> Just to explain, um, kind of briefly um, how split beam works. If we, if you imagine the conical beam divided into quadrants, well, uh, inside the face of the transducer, we have multiple elements. Only one of those elements is going to send a ping or a pulse, but the echo is going to be received on multiple elements, so multiple places in space, uh, the echo arrives, and it arrives with a slightly different uh, angle of arrival and time of arrival. And so split beam is me measuring that differential in the arrival, the different locations, different elements. And then using that information, it's a, uh, the split beam sonar is able to, to locate each target or fish relative to the axis of the beam. So this is important because as an object moves away from the center of the beam, it becomes less reflective. So by, by knowing exactly how far off center each target is, we can correct for the off-axis signal loss. 
and that gives us the true or corrected target strength of the object. So that in combination with the, the um, correction for, for range and absorption, um, of course, we, we, we can get this very accurate, reliable measure of target strength. Okay, so moving on to fisheries acoustics in general, if we think of the entire process, there's really two primary areas of effort. We gotta collect the data, which has several steps that we'll go through, and we process the data. And the reality is, you you know, typically we're, we can spend as much time working up with the data as we have collecting it. So for today's <coughs> uh, presentation, we're gonna be focusing much more on the data collection side of, of this process. So beginning with study design and survey planning, first thing is we have to really consider what are our objectives. Are we gonna measure the population of fish, the density of the fish? Are we doing a, a sizing or age class study? And then we look at the process process of study design. So we're going to, of course, we have to decide what our study area is and then develop a sampling or transect plan. And then we might consider also the timing, right, around the behavior of the animals. Uh, there's a lot of acoustics that's done at night when the fish are randomly distributed. Uh, just give you a couple examples this, uh, for planning our study design. Of course, we've got to consider our budget. How much resources do we want to apply to the study? How statistically accurate do we need to be? How fast will our boat travel? And from there, we can start to develop our transect plan. And we might uh, have a, a random um, transect plan. We could have, uh, of course, parallel lines. We could do concentric lines. And then how far apart those are spaced, again, is depending upon all of the above uh, considerations. So we're looking at, uh, here we're look, looking at how, how do we calculate the, the, the effort that is gonna be required. So if we consider this uh, fairly simple area, um, study area, roughly 260 by 500 meters. Well, if, we, if our transects are spaced 25 meters apart, we know our total distance, we know our boat speed, and we can very easily, uh, quickly estimate that it's gonna take less than three hours to survey this study area. Once we have our transect plan designed, and I should uh, offer also that if if you are in, in you know new to this this field and uh, Biosonics is is quite willing and able to offer suggestions and resources on on study design. We have a number of papers available, and we can also provide some guidance and and advice on how to um, space your transects to meet your requirements. Let's move on to the data collection process and actually operating the DTX Extreme Echo Sounder. Um, the DTX, I, sh I should point out, although this webinar is focused on fisheries and the fact that this is a fisheries echo sounder, uh, with the DTX, we can actually process the data uh, for fisheries habitat um, information. We can use that same data and look at, look at the, the seafloor and um, process it with some different software and, and measure uh, the height of our submerged plants. We can do um, bottom typing or substrate classification analyses. But um, again, today we're focusing on the fact that this is a fisheries echo sounder. <clears throat> a quick checklist of what the equipment, uh, what equipment would be necessary in order to go out and do a mobile survey. We need a boat of some kind. The boat can be a very small boat as shown here or it could be a full, uh, full size research uh, ship. Um, we need some form of power, of course. A power supply can be um, either AC or DC power. Um, we need an echo sounder. We need a, a mount for our transducer. We need a computer of some kind. It could be a laptop. That's most far most common is a laptop computer. Uh, and then a DGPS. When we begin setup of the echo sounder, there are two fundamental steps we, we really uh, cannot skip. Um, we need to install visual acquisition software. This is the data collection software available from Biosonics to operate and configure the echo sounder. It's, 
available on Biosonic's website as a free download, <clears throat> as is all Biosonic software. So we need to install visual acquisition on the computer we're going to use. And then we need to make a quick uh, adjustment to our network set settings in order to communicate with the DTX via Ethernet. So this insert is found in the box when you open up your echo sounder. Uh, the important information, please read first. Then from there, we open the lid of the echo sounder. This is what you see in the lid is a quick start guide. It's quite, uh, quite handy. And the, the quick start guide is going to walk you through every connection um, and step in order to uh, be completely ready to power up the echo sounder and, and get started collecting data. <clears throat> Mounting our transducer, uh, by far the most common method. Um, since this is a portable system, uh, quite often folks are using the DTX in a relatively small boat, maybe 10 meters or less. Um, so we, we have some kind of a pole that is attached to the side of the vessel, and then Biosonics supplies these, this swivel mount bracket that you see here. The swivel mount bracket has two U-bolts that connect to the post or pole, and this makes it uh, fairly easy to mount our transducer. There are other ways to deploy the transducer. Uh, this, this photograph I just came across is an amazing uh, image that was um, captured by one of our clients from the University of Washington um, doing some uh, deep ocean work here. And what you see here is, a, is a, what we call the biofin. And that's a, that's a sled or a towed body um, and on that, uh, the transducers are attached um, and then being towed in the water. So we can use a towed body. This gets the transducer down below the surface, away from that surface noise, and provides a very stable platform um, for the transducer. So once we have our transducer mounted, the echo sounder set up, um, we're going to launch visual acquisition. This is a visual acquisition, a typical screenshot you, you might see during data collection. As you can see, there's several different windows that comprise the um, software screens. We've got the echogram, the oscilloscope, target bullseye, and then a, a histogram showing uh, real-time uh, target strength distribution. So if we zoom in now, on the primary navigation, you'll see the upper left button, the orange button, is, is the configuration button. And so before we begin data collection, we have to configure the echo sounder for our specific uh, environment and our specific objectives. And so there are some parameters that will affect our ability to collect good data. Of course, we have to choose the right frequency transducer to match the range and the size of targets we're going to um, be uh, looking to detect. Then we can also uh, make some uh, specific adjustments in the configuration. We can uh, things like the pulse duration and the ping rate are very uh, important. So we're going to walk through the configuration of, of the DTX Extreme Echo Sounder. So when we click Config button, this is the menu that pops up, um, and so we have a vertical menu here from top to bottom. We're going to walk through these different configuration settings um, just one at a time briefly here to explain how we configure the echo sounder. The first page we see is the is titled the DTX Scientific Echo Sounder page. And so here um, really we're just adjusting the ping rate. So how many pings per second will the will the echo sounder emit? And a typical for a you know, relatively shallow water um, survey, we might be pinging somewhere between you know, four to seven times a second. The, the echo sounder is capable of pinging very rapidly, up to 40 times a second. Um, you might only want to try uh, pinging that quickly if you were perhaps in a horizontal fixed mount and we had maybe uh, some water moving by at, at, at a high rate of speed and we needed to ping very quickly in order to get enough echoes to form fish tracks. So 
after we send send the first ping, we, we have to wait for that echo to return before we can ping again. And so as our range increases, our, our maximum ping rate is going to decrease. If we get into very deep water, we may only be pinging once a second or even less. <clears throat> we do have a low power option setting available on the screen as well. Um, not very commonly used, but we might want to reduce the power output um, if we are in uh, very shallow water uh, and or in areas where the bottom is, is very, very hard, like bedrock or compact sand. Uh, we can drop the power, and that might help with saturation issues. Okay, next, the next screen we see is the transmit receive screen. And here, this is where we're going to um, adjust pulse duration. How long is that ping in milliseconds? And we can adjust from uh, 0.1 all the way up to one full millisecond. And so, um, again, a typical pulse duration might be uh, 0.4 milliseconds. And um, so we're going to choose our pulse duration based on the spacing and size of the targets. It's really um, defining the resolution of our data. And so um, if we had very small, tightly packed targets, we might reduce our pulse duration. Um, again, consult with Biosonics, uh, um, and we're more than happy to, to chat with you about your application and, and help select a pulse duration that's going to give you the best results. The screen, we also are able to adjust the start and end range for data collection. A lot of times we're just collecting from the surface to the bottom, so we might choose an end range that's perhaps 10% in excess of the maximum depth we expect to uh, encounter in our survey area. But we can set a bin range if we are interested in just midwater. We might collect from 20 to 60 meters, and that's all we're interested in. Well, that's fine. That we can just um, bin range our data that way. The next step. We have the sensors and mounting page. And really, the, the important uh, adjustment we're making here is we're entering the, the depth of the transducer face. So where is that transducer relative to the surface of the water? And this is going to give us a corrected uh, depth output on our display screen. Um, visual acquisition provides the ability to have a nice digital depth readout that we might want to use for navigation purposes. So if we want to correct that, we just simply enter the value here as to how deep is the transducer below the surface. Next up is a fairly important screen. This is the environment page. Here we're going to enter values that affect the speed of sound in water. Primarily, that's salinity and temperature. And so as we, as we enter those values, <clears throat> we will see the speed of sound in water correction um, in real time. So these, uh, this, this, the uh, speed of sound will actually um, affect our target strength values. And so again, if we <coughs> can, can at least make an estimate of the water temperature and salinity, it's going to really help our overall results. Next up is bottom detection. Bottom detection is um, primarily a, just a display function. Uh, during data collection, if we want to separate and have that bottom line, that's going to help um, with differentiating the bottom from uh, fish targets. And so there's a variety of settings here. Um, you might think of bottom detection and all these, these uh, minor adjustments as kind of tuning the knobs on your, your uh, amplifier to get the sweetest sound, okay? It's kind of where we can help the echo sounder um, detect the bottom as best it can by making some adjustments here. <clears throat> but the most important is that threshold. How much energy are we looking for in order to um, classify that that echo came from the bottom? <clears throat> of course, it is important to check the box at the top of the screen to enable bottom detection. These are threshold values. And then the trailing edge method is definitely going to give better results if we are in areas of uh, dense plants growing on the bottom. <clears throat> if you're having issues with bottom detection, 
uh, number one suggestion is try the default setting. They're going to work well most of the time. Then, of course, if you need further help, just give us a call or use your user guide to adjust your bottom detection setting. <clears throat> Next up, uh, echo detection. Um, there is a little bit of background noise. I don't know if someone's able to mute their phone. That would be that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, echo detection. Again, this is a display tool. This is going to allow us to highlight on our screen um, basically fish with a different color pixel. And so we can we can define an acceptable echo here and the characteristics of the echo, and um, and highlight individual echoes and fish on the screen as we're collecting data. Uh, next up, we have data logging, uh, and really this is simply how are our files named and where are we storing them. We can choose the location in our computer where we're storing data and add a suffix or prefix if we want to. The default's going to be a, just a timestamp on each data file. And we can also choose the duration of our files. So we don't want to, um, hour long files are going to be a little unwieldy. So uh, we can choose a, a maximum file duration. Uh, if we're collecting data continuously and we exceed that duration, um, Visual acquisition is going to automatically start and stop a new file in the background that is exactly 15 minutes long in this case. <clears throat> uh, you'll notice that I, I did skip in the configuration the auto track detection and auto track reporting. Auto track is a real time uh, processing tool that will create track lists. It'll, it'll actually do the split beam processing processing in real time and create CSV files um, in a lot of very usable information, such as the location and corrected target strength and fish density measurements. <clears throat> but AutoTrack in of itself um, can be an, uh, a webinar. Um, in fact, we do have um, that webinar posted um, online and in hard copy. Uh, if you're interested in learning about AutoTrack, just drop me an email after the conclusion of this session, I'd be happy to connect you with materials on how to use AutoTrack. So we've configured the echo sounder. We've gone through from top to bottom uh, um, all of our configuration settings. Now we're ready to turn on the echo sounder and, and get started with data collection. Get started with data collection. So we simply um, uh, click the rocker switch and turn on the echo sounder. And now we're ready to begin. A little visual aid for you there. So we're ready to go out and collect our data. Probably a good time to take a quick look at visual acquisition as it would appear uh, in real time. So I'll just jump over here. I have that visual acquisition running in the background. <coughs> This is a, a freshwater file collected in Lake Washington, locally here in Seattle. And I'm going to zoom in a bit. What you're looking at is, is a, about 60 meters deep uh, in the lake. And if I zoom slightly, um, these are all fish. And these fish are approximately Oh, 20, 20 centimeters, perhaps. <clears throat> and um, you can see that the density of fish begins just below 30 meters on the right-hand side. That's our, our range scale. The right-hand side of the echogram is range in meters. And so um, just go ahead and zoom from 25 to 60. And that's our the fish uh, aggregation, these fish like to stack up here pretty much all year long. We can find them out there in the middle of the lake in the main basin. Um, and so the, the left hand, uh, this, this spectrum of color, that's our uh, echo level. 
color scale. So the brighter, hotter colors indicate strong echo returns, and the darker, cooler colors are, are much lower um, intensity echoes. So the water itself is reflecting in the blues, and the bottom reflecting in this bright orange, and the fish are showing up kind of right in the middle at a, in, a, in the negative 40 to negative 50 decibel uh, range of echo level. If I pause for a moment, we can zoom in and look at some of these, these fish and at a much closer, <clears throat> have a much closer look. See these are, each of these is an individual fish and that fish, uh, in this case, we turn on our echo detection. You can see that we, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in this case, eight acceptable consecutive echoes were detected. We have formed a track here using auto track from those echoes. These are individual pings returned as echoes. So go back to full resolution, resume pinging. Our data collection using visual acquisition. In the center, we have the oscilloscope. That's one ping at a time. Uh, the same color scale applies, the same range scale. Each of these spikes in the oscilloscope is an individual fish target. So you can, it's a different way to display our data. Um, some people like the oscilloscope. If you don't like it, we can simply turn it off. We have our target bullseye on the right side. <clears throat> the bullseye, uh, you might imagine if you're looking over the side of the boat straight down, you're looking through the conical beam all the way to the bottom. That's really what you're seeing here in the target bullseye is each fish and its location relative to the axis. So as I click on this target here, this, this fish, Let's zoom in on the echogram. See if I can locate these fish in the echo in the echogram. Here we go. Double click. It's going to bring us to the corresponding uh, fish track in the echogram. Anyway, the point is there's a number of ways to view our data during data collection. <clears throat> Visual acquisition is, um, again, Windows-based, so we can resize any of these windows, add a second window if we choose. We have a second uh, transducer. And we have our histogram display giving us our real-time target strength distribution. And so with that, I think we'll return to the PowerPoint presentation and continue on. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we've pretty much, we've gone through the uh, overview of deploying the Echo Sounder, configuring the Echo Sounder, getting started and logging our, our data. Um, as suggested by the title of the presentation, and hopefully some of the, what may have piqued some of your curiosity is this, um, the autonomous mode. So a portable echo sounder with autonomous capabilities. Uh, let's talk about the, the autonomous operation of the DTX Extreme now. Really what we mean is inside the Extreme, we have a Linux processor. So that processor can control and operate the echo sounder without a connected laptop or PC. We also have some redundant storage drives inside with up to 30 days data storage capacity. 
And what we can do is we can program the DTX Extreme uh, to wake and sleep in order to conserve power and extend our data collection um, ability. Uh, and we'll, so we'll walk through how that works for the next few slides. <clears throat> well, why autonomous? What are some of the applications for autonomous uh, operations? Personally, um, I'm most excited about the autonomous boat. So if we have an autonomous vessel, it may not have either an onboard Windows computer or it may be out of Wi-Fi range. If we have Wi-Fi, we can still connect in a conventional manner to the Echo Sounder using a wireless Ethernet connection. But if we don't, now we can still operate our Echo Sounder on, a, on one, of the, one of these small autonomous uh, surface vessels. Other applications might be a, uh, a fixed deployment. And that could be from the banks of a river, the end of a pier, from a platf floating platform, uh, anywhere where we are interested in observation and data collection uh, over a period of days or weeks at a time, we're getting a whole different level of information in a fixed deployment. A mobile survey, you might um, consider as a snapshot, a picture of that moment in time. But a fixed deployment over weeks is going to give us much more uh, robust information about the behavior of the animals, migration, uh, behavior over day versus night. Uh, so all these sorts of information can be obtained using a fixed study. <clears throat> and now we have a very simple, low cost way to do you know, fairly long term over you know, up to a month uh, period of time. The DTX Extreme is quite versatile. It's a portable system, ability to collect auto autonomously. <clears throat> and we'll talk just now for a few minutes about how that works. Uh, from within visual acquisition, we choose setup and then click on autonomous mode. And from there, we're going to walk through several configuration screens uh, really similar to the configuration of the basic echo sounder that we already went through. First up, we have the autonomous uh, data collection screen. Um, this is where we set our duty cycle. So we're going to tell it how long to ping and then how long to sleep. <clears throat> we can also choose, um, the echo sounder has the ability to, to sense available power. It knows how much power it needs to operate. And so if our batteries or power supply is, is approaching a critical level, the echo sounder will do a smart shutdown. Um, and then it'll wait. And when it senses power has been restored, it will resume operation automatically. So here's where we can set the uh, battery tolerances. There's also some power saving options. We can turn off the internal GPS. Ethernet and Wi-Fi. <clears throat> um, here we can, uh, this next screen, the sensor screen, we choose our GPS uh, details, the, the, the mode. We can either tell it to use an internal GPS or if we have connected our own external, uh, we can also adjust the baud rate. <clears throat> and then we can um, adjust the update rate of the orientation sensor as well. Then we have the uh, file transfer, the ability to, this is where we manage our data and prepare for extracting or downloading our data. <clears throat> we kick, click on the file transfer button and we get a different pop-up screen. And this is where we can place different files in the queue for download. So fairly straightforward, um, easy to use as you can see, hopefully uh, that, that Biosonic software I would say across the board is quite well designed, very user friendly, and also very well supported with manuals and of course top notch uh, technical support staff during uh, normal working hours. So here's where we, again, we just simply navigate, choose the folder and export um, our data. <coughs> 
once we have configured the autonomous mode settings, then there is a physical switch that we need to uh, change. We hit the autonomous mode button, and now we can disconnect the computer, close the lid, and the DTX Extreme is going to begin pinging and logging data based on our duty cycle that we programmed. So all we need is some uh, battery or power supply and a transducer, of course, and that's our, that's our system. We're ready to go. So whether we've conducted a mobile survey or a fixed location study, in the end, we're going to wind up with uh, our data files. So in order to get usable information, we do need to post-process that data. Now, Biosonics provides an entire suite of software uh, available at no cost and for unlimited use. There's no license keys required for any Biosonics software. Uh, we provide a BizAC AutoTrack. Uh, this is a real-time, um, but also can be used in post-processing tool for generating track lists. We provide a visual analyzer, which is a more conventional processing tool using echo integration to uh, generate uh, fish density and total count uh, information. And then visual habitat, as I touched on earlier, uh, we can process the same data files and look at uh, plant height, plant density, do some bottom classification uh, analyses. There are some very, um, very good third-party software tools available. Um, they're actually available through Biosonics. We're an authorized distributor for EchoView and for Sonar 5 Pro. Uh, EchoView is developed out of Tasmania, a very, very popular software tool, uh, especially in North America. Uh, it is modular. It's sold in a modular uh, format. so. Once we have the base or essentials modules, we can add on other software modules for specific applications such as fish schools or target tracking. Uh, they have a multi-beam sonar mode. They have a whole array of, of, of software modes or modules. Uh, some very powerful processing tools uh, above and beyond the uh, free software provided by Biosonic. Similarly, Sonar 5 Pro uh, fairly commonly used. It's uh, developed by a gentleman named Helga Balk out of Oslo, Norway. Um, perhaps I might describe it as a more of a boutique software. It doesn't have quite the shiny wrapper as EchoView in terms of a you know, user guide and easy to navigate website and, and support materials of that of, uh, along those lines. But um, both both highly recommended um, for, for more advanced users or people who are going to be processing uh, large volumes of data. <clears throat> okay, we are uh, approaching the 45-minute mark here, so this is um, good timing to just have a quick summary, and then we'll wrap up today's uh, webinar presentation. Just to review the DTX Extreme, um, is a split beam sonar, uh, split beam echo sounder. It is the multi-channel, multi-frequency capability that really differentiates it. Um, this can be very useful for uh, operation in a small boat where we, we need or we desire to operate uh, multiple transducers. Um, we have a much more compact system, um, just one deck cable and a splitter cable, and we can operate um, up to four channels. Again, very easy to deploy using the swivel mount and a pole mount for the transducers. We can look at all sorts of uh, information on fish, the fisheries resource, but also the fish habitat. But most users of the DTX Extreme are going to be interested in water column studies, but primarily uh, looking at fisheries resources. 
the system's very rugged. Um, the Extreme came out with uh, with an IP rating of 67, so that's quite good. Um, all the connectors are located in a single panel. Um, all metal connectors. We have stainless transducer connectors. So uh, a very field-worthy instrument. It does have its own internal DGPS. It's an added convenience. Uh, the DTX Extreme has a Wi-Fi router, so we can connect to it uh, without a cable, either for operation or for uh, data extraction or exporting our data. Uh, we've included a digital readout, uh, gives us uh, our voltmeter and also some other information to be displayed on the digital readout. And it's got a series of indicator lights there showing operational status of the system. So quite smartly designed uh, with a lot of conveniences for the user. The autonomous mode we just went through, ability to log data uh, up to 500 gigs, which is right about 30 days at full volume. <clears throat> and so with that, um, we will conclude today's webinar presentation. Um, given we're recording the session, uh, we're not going to do a Q&A today, but I would uh, very much welcome uh, your emails or phone calls after the presentation be more than happy to provide uh, answers to your questions and or uh, pricing information on the system. Um, I'm very grateful for your time today. I hope you found this useful and I encourage you to visit Biosonic's uh, website at biosonicinc.com for further details and again or reach out and uh, drop me a line anytime. So thank you uh, one last time and I wish you all a uh, very good day or a nice evening. Take care. Thank you very much, Eric.